Greetings. Today, I'm excited to talk with you about a text from the early Christian period, from about the first or second century AD. A wonderful text that was rediscovered in the 19th century, and for most Orthodox Christians, people are not aware of this text. The text is known as the Didache, or in Greek, Ididache, and then the full title is the Didache, of the Twelve Apostles or the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. The text has a fascinating history and it begins actually in the fourth century, although the text was written much earlier. In the fourth century, Eusebius of Caesarea, a church historian, writes in his famous ecclesiastical history where he's talking about the various books of the Old Testament and books of the New Testament. And as he lists the canonical books of the Old Testament and those of the New Testament that he perceived in his world in Palestine in the fourth century that seemed to him, at least within his tradition in the church in Palestine, as the canonical texts of the New Testament, he also makes mention of a group of texts that are not recognized, but that are read. And then he lists a certain number of books, some of the Old Testament apocryphal that we're familiar with. And then he goes to a third category and a category that he speaks about spurious books, about books that are not attested to their authorship being to anybody from the apostolic tradition or from the apostolic church, but nonetheless seems to have been, seem to have been read by Christians in his time. And he's aware of this text. And as he lists several of these texts, Acts of Paul, Shepherd of Hermas, Apostles of Peter, he comes to a title, and the title is what he says is the so-called teachings of the apostles. That's all he says about it, the so-called teachings of the apostles. He doesn't quote from it. He doesn't give us any idea what's in its content in, other than it seems that Christians are aware of this text. And for Eusebius, he doesn't want to attribute it to the apostles. So there the text or the reference to this text, the teaching or in Greek, ididache, the didache, sits. A few decades later, Athanasius of Alexandria, St. Athanasius who was Bishop of Alexandria for much of the fourth century, writes in the year 367 a letter to his communities in and around Alexandria. And this letter is dated to the year 367 at the Paschal season. It was a traditional thing that the a bishop would do, would send out a letter to his community around the time of Easter. And in this letter, he lists the canonical books of the Old Testament and the canonical books of the New Testament. And after he lists these, and this is probably the first like full listing of the 27 books of the New Testament that we can actually point to, in a written text that says, here are the 27 books that we read in the New Testament that are now part of what we call the New Testament today. But then he adds a list of texts that he calls non-canonical, but that he recommends his Christians, his Christian community to read, to actually use as a catechism, as a, as a means of instruction, as a means of instruction for this, his, his Christian community. And within this list at the very end, he says, right before the Shepherd of Hermas, he says the so-called teaching of the apostles. This time he puts it in the singular, not in the plural. Ididahi ton apostolon. Again, he doesn't give us, like Eusebius, he doesn't give us any evidence of what's in the text, but he makes reference, and there's a title that he gives, and he says Christians should read this for catechetical purposes. Now the trail of this text runs dry. In fact, we don't see the the text, again, at least from a historical perspective, until, until the 19th century. And in Constantinople, in the year 1873, a metropolitan by the name of Philotheos Vrienios, Philotheos Vrienios in the English pronunciation, who was born outside of Constantinople, had been educated at the well-known and famous uh, uh, school of theology in Halki and, and there outside of Constantinople, he is now a metropolitan and he is working, he's very well educated, he's actually studied in Europe as well. He is working in one of the libraries in Constantinople around the, the Patriarchate of Constantinople that is owned by the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And he's working in the library and he comes across a codex, an 11th century manuscript, a book that is at the very end of the book is written by a scribe named Leo who gives the interesting date 
the interesting date of June 11, 1056. So in other words, this scribe named Leo finished copying this manuscript in, on June 11th of the year 1056. And he gives us his name and he says, Leo, the notary and sinner, and then finishes, the, then the text is finished. In this book, in this hand copied manuscript, Philotheos discovers a text known as Ididahi ton Apostolon. And sure enough, as he reads through it, it's a short text, he goes on to do some more research and reading and realizes that this is the text, perhaps, that Eusebius had mentioned in the fourth century and that Athanasius had mentioned as well in the fourth century. 10 years later, in 1883, he publishes the, the version of this Didaki Ton Apostolon, and it sets the sort of Christian academic world on fire. Here's a new text from the first sec century, second century of the Christian era that has not been read before by scholars. Uh, well, it actually had, but it hadn't been identified. We don't necessarily have time to get into that, but nonetheless, here's a text that has a title, The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, rediscovered in a manuscript dated in the 11th century, and now it's been published for the world to look at and to read. And really, this text caught Christians by storm, especially those academic Christians who were interested in the early history of Christianity. Over the last 150 years, the study of the text has exploded, I would say even more so in the last 20 years, and questions about more particularly its date, like when can we date this text? The earliest copy that we have of the full text is 11th century, but as scholars have worked through some of the earlier, earlier other texts, we find actually wholesale sections of the Didache taken out and copied in other texts, but never identified as the Didache. Now scholars look at this text and they go, what does it tell us about the earliest time of Christianity? It tells us some marvelous things. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of them. What I would like to share today is the message of this didache, of this text, that can be used for us as Christians during Lent. The date of the didache is a fascinating conversation. And I'll just, for our purposes here, so we can locate it, most scholars would place the compilation, maybe the writing of the text, maybe the compilation, it might have been from various different parts, to somewhere around the year 90 AD to 110 AD. So I'm gonna focus around the year 100 AD, and for our purposes, if we think about the text as being written around 100 AD, that is quite early. If we think that scholars place the Gospels of Matthew and Luke around 80 to 95 AD, the Gospel of John somewhere 90 to 100 AD. This text is written around the same time or compiled around the same time. So it's a wonderful window into earliest Christianity of the first century AD. The text is broken up into three sections. There's one opening section which is almost about half of the text, a little more than a third of the text, and this section is called the two ways. There's a second section which more about an inter, a, a way about how one ought to practice one's Christian faith, about baptism, about Eucharist, about prayer, about fasting, kind of those practical things that we do. And then there's a final third section. It's a mini apocalypse, if you will. It's a small final little chapter. When chapter is really too large of a word. It's you know, maybe um, 12 or 14 sentences long or lines long. Uh, actually probably less than that in the manuscript. But nonetheless, it's just a small little section talking about the second coming of Christ. I want to focus on these three parts of the text relatively quickly. First, the first part. The text opens up with the following phrase. There are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between these two ways. And now the didache, this text opens up with this notion that there are two ways to approach life. There's the good way, the bad way, the way of life, the way of death, death, the moral life, the immoral life. This notion of life as having sort of two paths is not new to Christianity. Ancient Greek philosophers, 
Um, the philosopher, um, historian Xenophon wrote about this as well. Hesiod has a reference to the two ways in his, in his uh, histor history book as well. In fact, Moses in, in the book of, uh, uh, um, excuse me, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 30, 19, he says, quote, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. The author of the Didache is using this tradition of two ways to live one life, one, one's life. You can choose the path of life, i.e., for the author of the Didache, salvation, or the path of destruction, the path of death. There's lots of things in this first part of the Didache, the two ways, the way of life and the way of death, that one can lift up. Okay, and there's a variety of ethical, of ethical living that one comes out, but the Didache starts out with two basic commandments that we as Christians follow all the time. And in fact, it's the same two basic commandments that Christ told the young men who said, what do I need to do to be made perfect? Or better yet, what are, what's the greatest commandment? He, he's asked what Jesus has asked, what is the greatest commandment? And so the Didache starts out that there are two commandments. The first is to love God and love your neighbor. That's one commandment. And the second is a list of do nots. Don't commit adultery, don't fornicate, don't steal, don't lie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these do nots that we that we know of as Christians, not only from our Jewish roots from the book of the Old Testament, but as Christians moving into the time of Christ. Another important aspect of the way of death is identified as those people who follow the way of death have no mercy for the poor, a direct quote from the Didache, or quote, do not work on behalf of the oppressed. So there's this real notion here that the way of death is a passage, a path that one follows that does not take care of the most marginalized people of society. And that certainly resonates, absolutely resonates with what Christ teaches of us. So we have this way of life and this way of death. The second part of the Didache is really these church practices. And these church practices are a variety of practices, baptism, Eucharist, fasting, um, et cetera. I'd like to list three very, very quickly. One deals with baptism. What's fascinating about this text is it gives us a a historical window into how baptism was performed in the earliest church. But what's, one, what's very interesting is that the Didache says that those who are about to be baptized, now remember, in the earliest Christ church, baptism was done as an adult. You were baptized as an adult, not as a child. Infant baptism doesn't really develop until the fourth and fifth centuries. So in the earliest Christianity, you're baptized as adult. And the, the text says to those who are about to be baptized to fast, to fast one or two days. Interesting. We'll come back to fasting in a minute. But then it goes on to say, those who do the baptizing should fast as well. That's very interesting, right? Those who do the baptizing, i.e. the priest, should fast as well. Let's extrapolate for a second from that. And let's think about our own context as Orthodox Christians today when it comes to baptism. Usually it's an infant baptism, and so the young baby isn't going to fast. But what if the sponsor considered their role in the spiritual aspect of their role and actually prepared for their role as sponsorship by fasting? Much like the Didache asks for the person who's going to do the baptizing to fast along with the person that is being baptized. And in fact, the Didache also says, those in the community who can fast should fast as well. Very interesting, right? Remember, fasting is a spiritual exercise, a spiritual exercise that helps us remove the world and focus on what's important. And here, what's really important is receiving salvation through the the sacrament of baptism and the, the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the, of the seal of the Holy Spirit. And to prepare oneself for that, one should fast. Not just that, the one who's being baptized, the one who does the baptizing, and now we could extrapolate into our context today, perhaps the sponsor.
Fasting, really quick, what does fasting mean in the early Christian context? It probably doesn't mean abstaining from certain foods. It really means the total abstention of food for a given period of time. And that's usually for one whole day, maybe for two days at the most. So that kind of, it's not fasting, I abstain from meat, I abstain from dairy. As, we, as fasting has developed over time in the Orthodox tradition, in the first and second centuries AD, fasting is really about a complete fast. And again, it's removal of food for two reasons. One, as we already said, to focus on what's important, the spiritual life and our commitment to Christ and to God. But also, the other practice was to take that money that we would have spent on our food and give, to give alms to the poor. So the money that we would have spent on our meals for that day, part of that practice, although the DDK doesn't say that specifically, but we have other references to fasting in the early church that suggests that one takes that money that you would have spent on food and provide it for the poor. For the poor. One final piece here um, about the practical things, the practical guides that the DDK gives. There's a whole section in the DDK on what do you do with a Christian who comes into your community around 100 AD, who has the title of prophet or has the title of apostle. These kinds of titles were still around at the end of the first century AD. Who has that title, comes into your community, you already have a bishop or a priest or a deacon in your parish, in your community there, and comes in and says, I'd like to preach to you. I'd like to teach you about the gospel. This seems to be an issue because it's, it's, there's a fair amount of text in the Didache that deals with this. The Didache's answer is very practical, but also very spiritual. The practical aspect is, okay, someone comes into your community and says, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I've been sort of given this authority from, a, it's not quite clear from where, and I'm going to give you a sermon or a couple sermons, or I'm gonna teach you about the message of Christ. So what the Didache says, welcome them, let them stay. If they stay for one day, wonderful, listen to them, move them on. If they stay for two days, mm, they might be looking just for food and money. And if they stay for more than two days, then they're a false prophet or a false uh, apostle. Then the Didache goes on and says the following. But if someone does show up and you do not allow that person who claims to be an apostle or a prophet. And again, that term, those terms are very loose at this point in the, in the sense that it doesn't mean an apostle like the 12 apostles, but claims to have one of these offices. You do not do the following. Do not say goodbye. We don't need you. We don't need to listen to you. We've got our own people. We've got our own folks. And here's the rationale, and it's a spiritual rationale. The rationale of the DDoC case says that if you say no to that person without testing that person, without letting that person speak or preach or teach in your community, and then evaluating them, but if you don't even give them a chance, you may have committed the one unforgivable sin. And what is that one unforgivable sin? The sin against the Holy Spirit. How? Because you denied the possibility that that itinerant prophet or apostle has the Holy Spirit and that that person is preaching, teaching with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't allow that person to at least share that gift, you have denied the Holy Spirit to that person or the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you have denied the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you have committed the one unforgivable sin, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful teaching for us today too often we say, ah, we know what's right. We know what's best. We don't need to listen to anybody. You never know, right? You never know when the Holy Spirit is going to show up on your doorstep in the person of, a, of an ill person, in a friend who has a message, in somebody that you don't know. And so it's better to listen, to hear, and then to make your determination as opposed to simply determine and to judge right? It's almost like that phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. You got to read the book to really judge the book. So it's practical advice, but also really important spiritual advice. Finally, the last section of the DDK is this apocalypse, this last section, small section that talks about the second coming of Christ. 
Remember that around the year 100 AD, Christians are still very much believing and expecting that Christ is going to come soon, sooner than later. When Christ was crucified, buried, rose from the dead, and then ascended to heaven, the earliest disciples of Christ, and then for a few generations after that, really were expecting Christ to return. Christ said, I will come back and establish the kingdom of my Father. And if you read Paul's letters, Paul's letters are especially the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, there's a lot of reference to Christ is coming, get prepared. This message is also found in the Didache, the very last section of the Didache. And I think there are two points that the Didache makes here that are really important for us as Christians as we walk through our journey in Lent and ultimately our journey as Christians. The first is, do what you can. So this comes in the sense that, think about our Lenten journey. Our Lenten journey is a lot of do's and don'ts. All right, we should, go to, we should go to church more often, we should pray more often, we should give alms to the poor, we shouldn't eat this food, we shouldn't do that, we shouldn't do this and that. A lot of do's and don'ts, right? A lot of lists of things that we should do. And we're always kind of encouraged to do the best we can, but if we can't get to that highest level, it's still kind of okay because we did our best. The Didache has a wonderful line in the middle of the text, not at the very end, but has a wonderful line after going through the way of life and the way of death. At the very end, it says to the reader, quote, if you are able to bear the whole yoke of the Lord, you will be perfect. If you are not able, do what you can. It's so simple, right? You wanna be perfect? Carry on the whole yoke of the Lord, but not all of us can be that perfect. We will try, we will continue to try, and remember the, the word here is be perfect, becoming perfect, it's a process. But if you can't, do what you are able. I think that's a really important message during Lent, that we all try to become as perfect as we can to walk on the path towards perfection, but not to beat us up when we don't get there or when we fall and we do the best that we can. Secondly, and finally, this last section of the Didache reminds the Christians to be watchful. The Greek word is grigorite. Does it sound familiar? Grigorite. It's the word that's used in the parable in Matthew 25 of the 10 virgins. It's that story that we read in the hymnograph that refers to on Holy Tuesday and Matins of Holy Tuesday about being watchful. In fact, all of Lent is about being watchful, especially heightened during the last week of Christ's life that we remember during Holy Week. To be watchful because you don't know, because I don't know, because we don't know when Christ will come again. The author and the readers or listeners of the Didache probably believed that Christ was coming really soon. Well, more than a millennia later, we're still waiting for Christ. And we might ask ourselves, all right, did we get it wrong? No, we didn't get it wrong. Because Christian, Christians are called to be watchful always. Whether it means Christ will come as his second coming that could happen tomorrow, we don't know. Christ said, no one knows the hour or day or time except the, my Father in heaven, or whether it's our own mini kind of second coming, where somehow Christ presents himself to us in another person, in an opportunity, in a way to give aid, health, help to somebody, or unfortunately, if it's our own death, if our death is knocking at our door, are we prepared? Are we watchful? And so the Didache ends with this call that is a really a call for all of Lent and in particular for Holy Week. Be watchful and the best way to be watchful is to read what the Didache has to say about how to live a Christian lifestyle and try to keep the entire yoke of the Lord. But if you can't, keep it all, do what you can. Thank you.